We're going to look at that, that passage in Matthew shortly. I assume we had it read to us. I was out the back. I'm seeing some nods. Good. Well, why don't I pray as we come to that passage? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we see and hear of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you might speak to us through your word this morning. Amen. Well, just before we get started, I don't know if anyone knew, but we've actually got a, uh, a church lunch today. Uh, and I was asked to uh, provide the church lunch for us. So I've, I've, got, uh, I've got our lunch. So this is what we got. Uh, I hope you like fish. So we've got a, uh, some, some tuna uh, and a, a bread roll. And I was, um, I've been asked to provide you with a really good meal, uh, but I've got a, a tin of tuna uh, and a bread roll. And now I wonder whether your Christian life or, or, or indeed your, your life in general ever feels like that. Jesus has asked me to do these things, but what I have feels so inadequate. That, that Jesus places demands upon us that we can't meet. And he asks us to serve him in ways that we can't manage. And uh, whether you're a, a, you say you're a Christian or not this morning, does it feel like Jesus is, is just asking the impossible? Here, uh, you give them something to eat. And we're going to see in our passage today just what is it like to serve Jesus? What is our king like? And what does that mean for being in his kingdom? Because that's where we've got to in Matthew, isn't it? We've, we've seen all these uh, uh, kind of parables and accounts about the kingdom. And if, if you remember, the kingdom is the saving reign of King Jesus, the saving reign of King Jesus, where, where people delight that Jesus is king, where people submit to his rule, where people love that he is their king and want to follow him. And we know, don't we, that, that Jesus rules everywhere, but his kingdom is where we love and acknowledge the king. And if you were here last week, we saw, if we don't have Jesus as king, what do the other choices of king look like? We're all going to follow someone. What do the other choices look like? And they look like King Herod. They look disgusting. They look lecherous. They look weak. They're the people who bring in other people's heads on a plate. And we're going to see this morning what it's like to follow Jesus, our king, compared to, to kings like that. And for sure, serving Jesus might feel hard sometimes. But, but no one's going to manipulate him into uh, bringing your head in on a plate. And we're going to see that Jesus is the great king and the glorious king and the wonderful king. And these next few chapters of Matthew, we're going to see what does it look like that he's king, that he calls us, that he, he shapes us into his new people, the kingdom of heaven centered around King Jesus. And as we go through this, there's going to be a question, is this your king? Is this the king that you want to follow? And to serve and to love. We've seen, haven't we, on the news, there have been loads of blue and, and yellow flags this week. The, the, the Queen had blue and yellow flowers, didn't she? The flags of allegiance and solidarity with Ukraine. And what kind of flag of allegiance and solidarity is flying in your life? I stand with King Jesus and his people. And we're going to see that while that's not going to be easy, 
It's going to be incredible and wonderful. And we're going to see that Jesus is the king who brings life and hope. And following other kings, other things that we, we might think are more valuable in life, that brings bitterness and emptiness and ultimately death. What is our king like? And what is it like being in his kingdom? And as we do that, we're going to walk through this passage and we're going to see that we can rejoice because King Jesus provides. We can rejoice because King Jesus provides. So grab that passage, have it in front of you on your Bible or your phone or whatever. And we're just going to walk through it. So we, we saw at the beginning that Jesus has just heard this account that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been, has been brutally murdered in prison. And the news of that has come to Jesus. And if you remember, John was the, the man that Jesus said, this is the, the greatest man who's ever been born. This is the one who announces the kingdom, the, the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he's been killed by this this bitter wife of the petty king. And look in verse 13. When Jesus heard what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And it's not surprising, is it? Jesus has heard this this kind of terrible news. And he seeks peace and communion with God, his father. But he's not going to get it. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Uh, Of course they do. Of course they do. They're they're amazed. They're drawn in by Jesus' authority. The authority we've seen over sickness and over sin and demons. And as we read verses like this, we we realise that Jesus is no ordinary rabbi. No one else would have this kind of following. And he, he gets in the boat and he, he makes his way across the top of, of Lake Galilee and the crowds rush and they kind of rush around inland and they're there, aren't they, when, when, when he comes. And what's Jesus like? What's it like in his kingdom? When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he, he what? He withdrew again and sought his own private time. He established a strict cordon to keep people out of the way. He rebuked the crowd for coming too near him. No. He had compassion on them and healed those who were ill. Friends, this is what the heart of King Jesus is like. The king of great compassion, even at great cost. We know his desire was for for peace and reflection. And yet as these crowds came, he was... Filled with compassion when faced with these great needs. And isn't that why we can rejoice? That that Jesus has great compassion on those who need him. We had some verses from Hebrews earlier, and we this is a big thing that the, the writer of the Hebrews picks up on that Jesus' life gives us confidence as we're in his kingdom today. Let me read to you from Hebrews 4. We do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can rejoice because Jesus provides compassion on those who need it. I don't know, maybe you felt weak or burdened or fearful this week. Jesus is the king. He'll never be too tired or or too busy or too preoccupied to listen. Jesus is the king who has compassion on his people. That we can bring our needs and our weaknesses to him in prayer. 
And the crowd has come, haven't they? And they've been with him all day. Look down at 15 to 17. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Uh, Send the crowds away. that They can go to the villages and buy some food. Now, we want to listen carefully to this bit because it's kind of right what this passage is about, isn't it? It's not just about Jesus, but this interaction between Jesus and his disciples. And do you remember what these Gospels are about? Who is Jesus? What does it mean to follow him? That's what we see right here. And the disciples come to Jesus. And it amuses me this bit. They, They sort of set themselves up as those who... They're kind of tapping Jesus on the shoulder and say, "Um, Jesus, I I don't know if you've thought about this. I know you've been really busy. Have you thought about these folk here? They're going to get really hungry, Jesus. I don't know. I know you've been busy. Have you thought this through? And Jesus' response is just brilliant. He draws us into the story and he's testing them. And he's showing them his heart and his power and his identity. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Just think about that for a minute. So to start off just counting the men, I don't know how many, how many slices of bread, if you're a man, how many slices of bread would you have in your main meal if you'd been out all day? I'd say maybe average about four, maybe a bit more. Peter maybe would have more. Peter's laughing at the idea of four slices. We're going to stick with four slices. I think I'd eat four slices, no bother, and and come back for pudding. And I'd probably have a a tin of tuna with it. (laughs) Or whatever fish takes your fancy. Sea bass, I imagine, for kind of sophisticated fish. So, now, apparently the average loaf of bread, there was some discussion about this, because some people saying, oh, bread's got less bread in than it used to do. The average loaf of bread has 20 slices in. So Jesus is saying... Right, guys, a thousand loaves of bread and 5,000 tins of tuna. You give them something to eat. They say, no, Jesus, we've got five little bread buns and two fish. And we haven't got a thousand loaves of bread. We haven't got 5,000 tins of tuna. We've got five bread buns and two tins. And that's not going to go very far. What you're asking is impossible. And that's why, that's where the test is, the lesson is for these disciples and for us. Does it feel at times that this is what we're being asked to do? That God is saying, do this. And we think, well, that's impossible. I I can't do that. That that requires resources and abilities far beyond what I've got. Have you ever felt that in your, your life? God is calling you to be obedient in that relationship, in that situation, in ways that is beyond your power. God is calling you to serve and provide for others in ways that you can't. Maybe your your ministry area at church, you think, I can't do that. Maybe a caring relationship, you think, I cannot continue to give out in this way day after day. Maybe with kids or, or parents or siblings. Maybe you feel like God is asking you to forgive the most painful things in the most difficult circumstances to love. And you think, I cannot do that. You give them something to eat. When I was preparing this, I hadn't quite realized how applicable this would be. You might have been able to tell that I haven't had the best of health this week. Uh, We we, uh, we haven't had COVID, but I think we could go so far as to say a hyper cold. We've had a hyper cold. And to be honest, it's made us feel like we can't do this this week. We've still got to look after the kids. We've still got to write the sermon. You give them something to eat. Now, you don't have to feel too sorry for me. It, it really wasn't that bad. The, the other elders were really helpful. People prayed. But it helps us to see this is not a million miles away from us, is it? That being in the kingdom is just this list of impossible demands. You give them something to eat. And just a word here, if you're you're listening, and perhaps you wouldn't say you're a Christian, and maybe you think this is what being a Christian is. It's God saying, 
be perfect. Do everything for everybody. Like a kind of despot ruler to his cowering subjects. Do this. You give them something to eat. And we're going to see really what's it like in the kingdom. What's Jesus saying as he, as he tests his disciples? Let me read to you part of a, a book I, I read this week. In this story, the disciples saw. I wonder how you'd finish that sentence. In this story, the disciples saw the size of the need and the littleness of human resources available. Jesus saw. Well, now you complete that sentence. Let's have a look. Read from me. Read with me verse 18. Bring them here to me, he said. And he told the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, as well as women and children. What a glorious account of the life of the kingdom. Now we've got to get one thing straight, haven't we, as we get into this. This is a miracle of creation. This is a miracle of creation. Maybe you've heard that kind of thing floating around that, that, that someone produced food and everybody else felt a bit guilty and they, they sort of, oh, it turned out that they did have their packed lunch with them after all. That is not what is recorded here. Matthew's written this down because he clearly believes and he would have us clearly believe that this is a unique miracle of creation. This is something that no human being could do. Let me read to you the end of that quote. In this story, the disciples saw the size of the need and the littleness of human resources available. Jesus saw the size of the need and the greatness of God's resources. The greatness of God's resources. And that's the point of the story, isn't it? To contrast the greatness and glory of the king with just the way that the disciples are inadequate without the king. And Jesus does this in the the trusting relationship with his heavenly father and has access to all the unlimited riches and power of God himself. See what it's saying? Jesus is the one who brings all of God's blessings to needy people. All of God's blessings to needy people. And sure, he uses his disciples to do that, doesn't he? But the power comes through his unique relationship with his father. He looks up to heaven and he gives thanks. And the bread is given out by the disciples. And we can rejoice because King Jesus provides. And what a, what a provision that it is. In a moment, I'm going to show you a picture, but I want to tell you about it. So um, I think quite a few of you know, before I was a pastor, I worked for a few years uh, for an engineering consultancy. And we worked for this engineering consultancy. And part of the time when I was there, they, they got taken over by a Scandinavian company. And it was, uh, because it was, I think it was 2007 or something, it was pre-credit crunch, so there was loads of money floating around. And to celebrate this acquisition, they said, well, we're going to take all of the employees of this company over to Denmark for a big party. And it was fabulous. And they, they rented the grounds of this big castle in Denmark near, near Copenhagen. And there was food and drink and entertainment. And they had a, a Swedish stand-up comedian, which was funnier than it sounds. Uh, and, and as part of the day, they had a picnic lunch. So if we get the picture up, so you can see the picnic lunch here. You can't um, really see it. At the, at the back up there, so this is the table. At the back up there, there's kind of 
you know those metal trolleys you get in Sainsbury's? So there's all of this food kind of again and again on those, those, those trolleys. And it just so happens that the number of people who was there was a little over 5,000 people. It's just one of those weird things. And so this photo, this is what food, a picnic lunch for 5,000 people, this is what it looks like. And indeed, because it was Denmark, it's basically bread and, and, and fish. Herring, if people like herring. And let me tell you, 5,000 people's worth of picnic is a lot of food. It's just a vast quantity of food. And did you hear it in verse 20? They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. And this was 5,000 people in total. And we read in the passage it was 5,000 men and women and children. And they'd been standing there all day, uh, kind of craning their necks and pricking up their ears and listening to Jesus. And they get more than they could possibly eat. And 12 baskets are left over. When King Jesus provides, he does it in abundance. No one's left feeling disappointed. They all ate and were satisfied. King Jesus provides. Did you see, he did it by means of his disciples, didn't he? He gives the loaves to the disciples and they give it to the people. And what they could not do by themselves, what, what they might have thought he was mad even to suggest, with Jesus' power, it's simply a case of them giving out of his abundance. Is that not a great message for us today as we, we feel like weary disciples? We see the great needs out there and in our lives. We see the weakness of our abilities. And King Jesus provides all the resources we need to distribute his grace. Isn't it glorious to be a, a church that is well aware of its own weaknesses? And yet instead of that making us feel unable, we see the power of God's provision. We remember this next time serving is hard or, or living as a Christian indeed is hard, that we do not give and serve out of our own resources. That's bound to look inadequate. We look to Jesus, our provider. Again, I, I know we keep saying this, but God keeps laying it on our hearts as an eldership that this makes us a church dependent upon prayer. We serve with the grace God provides. We live a life in the spirit of God's provision and so we must pray. And it helps us as we try and live as Christians in a world that's hostile or, or apathetic. Just as Jesus generously, abundantly provided this food for his disciples, he abundantly provides his spirit for those who need it. This, this kingdom life that God calls us to be part of, it's impossible, isn't it? We can't do it by ourselves. It's like, 5,000 people with a tin of tuna, it's impossible. But with the greatness of God's resources in his spirit, it can be done. And we remember this. Next time we feel we cannot battle that temptation. Next time we feel like we cannot love that person again or be gracious one more time. We cannot speak up for what is right. We cannot by ourselves. But in the power of our King Jesus, we have strength in abundance. That's why we seek him in prayer and trust his provision. And the more this encourages us to rejoice that Jesus is the provider, the gracious provider. This passage just shows us that so clearly, doesn't it? When we, we think back to the Old Testament, who is it who provides for his people time and time again? Who feeds those in need? It's God, isn't it? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. And does this not show that Jesus is the Lord 
himself in human form who provides. He is and he does what, what the only God in the Old Testament does. He's showing again and again who he is. It shows us the truth as we look back. And it shows us the truth now, doesn't it? As we said earlier, Jesus provides for his church as we depend on him. It's why we rejoice together. We have a great abundance of resources in Jesus. And sometimes we feel a bit small, don't we? As a church, we often wonder, who's going to serve here? Who can help fill this area of need? Where, where is our next generation of leaders? Will we have the resources to do everything that we need to do? And the truth of this passage is for right now, for his kingdom people, the Lord provides. We have and we will continue to have everything we need to do everything God has called us to do. That's not everything that we want to do. And the disciples, they don't go back to Jesus and say, um, Jesus, that's great, but there's not enough for next week. Jesus hadn't asked them to do that. He gave them enough to do what he wanted them to do. And we trust and we look around and we trust in God's provision for everything he wants us to do. So we look back, we look around and we look forward. And this points us to abundant provision in Christ for eternity. On what does our future hope depend? It rests upon the abundant provision of King Jesus. That he provides gloriously to those in dire need. And these people come to Jesus in need, don't they? They have sickness and and disease and hunger and we come to Jesus in need. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. That we need his grace to deal with our rebellion. That each one of us has in our hearts lived like King Herod, if we're honest. And trying to silence God's message to get what we want. And Jesus is the abundant host of lavish grace. Doesn't the story remind us, Jesus doesn't kind of go this just what you need for your exact nutritional needs. He showers in abundance. And we rejoice because Jesus provides abundantly. Just a a tiny picture of this, a, a little sketch of that glorious final feast with Jesus the host to which each one of us is invited. Will you come? Will you come and feast with him and delight In his provision, he doesn't invite you to a a kind of meal of drudgery where every morsel has to be earned. He invites us to a lavish feast where everyone can eat and be satisfied. There's leftover to spare for anyone who would come. Will you come and eat with your king? Let me read some words from Isaiah 25 and then we'll pray. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich foods for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all the people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation.